Amen. Well, I am so excited to hear what uh, God has put on Brother Bob Bonison's heart. When I first met Brother Bob, I knew that he had a, a mind like no other. And um, I appreciate his wisdom. I appreciate his encouragement. And I appreciate the example that, that him and his wife set. Boy, the, the love that they have for one another. And, and um, if any young couple wants to know uh, how a loving marriage should work, that they ought to look at Brother Bob and Miss Cheryl Bonison. And uh, I appreciate his heart, appreciate uh, what, what he means to our church, and uh, what he means to me as his pastor. He, uh, I love Brother Bob Bonison, and he has something that God has put on his heart. And so I want you to give him a hand of encouragement and welcome to Brother Bob as he comes to speak, okay? Well, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Um, I'm sure this is a very difficult thing for our pastor to do, Brother Josh. I know how hard it is to give up your, your pulpit on a Sunday night. And so I consider this a special honor and a privilege. And thank you, sir, for allowing me to come and share my heart on these important matters. Uh, Brother Josh met me out in the hall uh, just a little bit ago. And he just put his arms around me like he likes to do. And uh, just prayed, had a word of prayer for me. And uh, I think if we could just get him a little bit more enthusiastic about things, we'd have us. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever met uh, a young man with any more enthusiasm and excitement than Brother Josh has, and I thank the Lord for that. Well, I have some very uh, important things to tell you tonight, something that is extremely important that I think is important. Uh, perhaps the most important thing you may ever hear in your whole life is contained in some of these words that I'm going to share with you in just a minute. It's something that will profoundly affect your future, not just yours, but mine as well. Even more important than anything you'd hear watching the Super Bowl tonight. And uh, by the way, please allow me to be part of the congregation tonight as well. I belong out there just as much as I do here. What the words that I'm going to say to you tonight are from the Word of God. And I get to be the mouthpiece and to read some of these verses to you. But this is, this is the Word of God, I believe. And I need it just as much as anyone else. There's a wonderful little verse in the book of Psalms that's part of the Song of Moses, I understand. It says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. If you've known me for any period of time, you've probably heard me say that verse many, many times. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. So how many more days do we have left? How many more days do you have left? How many more years? How many more months? How many more Januaries do you have left in your life? We just don't know, do we? The truth is we all have to die. One of these days we're all going to pass away. The rich and the poor, the famous and the not so famous, the wise and the unwise, the saved and the unsaved, we're all going to have to die. In the next few decades, there's a good many of us here tonight that won't be here 10 years from now. We're all going to face eternity pretty soon. You may put your shoes on in the morning, but the undertaker will take them off at night. I was looking through the web the other day, and I came across this uh, little piece of information about the number of important people that had died in 2016, and I read these the other day, but let me just read some of them to you. Some folks that they listed famous people like Natalie Cole and Harper Lee, who wrote uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, Nancy Reagan, former first lady of our country, Frank Sinatra, Jr., Joe Garagiola, you remember him? And Patty Duke, one of my favorite little actresses on television, passed away in 2016. Merle Haggard, Maurice Safer, Muhammad Ali, used to love to watch this man box, box years ago. Gene Weidler, uh, he wrote a couple of famous things. And Hugh O'Brien, I remember him playing on the uh, TV. What was he playing? He was playing Wyatt Earp. Remember him, Hugh O'Brien? Arnold Palmer, this uh, famous golfer, passed away last year. Florence Henderson from the Brady Brunch, John Glenn, if I remember right, I'm not sure that I've got this correct, but he was the first man to exceed the sound barrier. And then he was also the first astronaut from the United States. And then Zsa, Zsa Gabor, got no idea anything about her, but her name is fun to say, Zsa, Zsa Gabor. And Carrie Fisher, uh, she starred in some of the Star Wars movies. And then her mother, Debbie Reynolds, I remember Debbie Reynolds from back in the 50s, passed away just recently. And then from our own clan, Eunice Stanley, a wonderful lady, passed away. She was almost 100 years old. She died January 2, 2016. Joe Redman, Janice Mixon, a good friend of mine, Billy Joe Adams, 
from Adam Shoemaker Construction. I don't know if you knew him or not, but he passed away. And then my own brother Bill uh, died in October, uh, just this last year. I'm not trying to be or overly morbid here with you tonight, but I'm just trying to get your attention. Teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The writer of Ecclesiastes puts it like this, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death better than the day of one's birth. Did you know that? The day of your death is better than the day of your birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. That is, it's better to go to a funeral than it is to go to a picnic. Why? For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. So doesn't it make sense to you tonight that we ought to think about what's going to happen to us after we die? Doesn't it make sense to you that if there's any way for us to plan for that event, we ought to do it? Doesn't it make sense that we ought to put our treasure in heaven? So how do we put treasure in heaven? There's a wonderful little verse that I'd like to read to you. And uh, did you all get one of these things? Did everybody get one? One of these little book markets? Did you folks get one? Do we have any left over, brother? There's a couple down here on, on my left that did not get one, if you get one for them. This is the little book marker that we prepared for our senior fellowship. Martha Greeson does an outstanding job of coordinating, coordinating at senior fellowship. If you're over 50, I guess we can say if you're over 40, you ought to come to the senior fellowship. We meet every... Is it the second Tuesday of every month, Martha? Second Tuesday of every month. We meet up back here in the fellowship hall. We have great fellowship. We have wonderful food, a good time of entertainment. I have met some unusual people. Just, just this last month, we had a little uh, black boy who had written a book. And uh, a year or so ago, we had uh, Ashley Moffat, I believe it was, who had written a book. Uh, she's the daughter of our former pastor, Tim Moffat, who was here 20 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And his little daughter, who grew up in this church, wrote a book. And she came over and explained her book to us. Uh, through, as a group, we've gone to the Panama City Museum. I didn't even know there was a museum until Martha figured it out and took us all down there. And we saw some wonderful things. And uh, we've been all kinds of places. We even went over to New Orleans one time and saw, was it King Tut's Treasures, I think it was, and some famous Bible scriptures. Things that the average Christian would never get to do, but you get to do it if you come to the Senior Fellowship. So I don't know what the lowest age is, but it's somewhere around... Should we say 12? <laughs> Anybody who'd like to come, I'm sure would be more than welcome. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do on Tuesday morning. Let's read this verse. It says, in, and this is in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you've read this verse carefully, you've noticed at least three things in it. First of all, it says, do not store up treasure on earth. Think about that. What can you store up on earth that will last for more than just a little bit? Everything you store up is going to rot or ruin or rust or corrode. I've got little bicycles that I've had for years and years, and they get all rusty. Anything I put out in my shed turns rusty. The clothes that we get gets moth-eaten, or we grow out of them, or our shoes get worn out. Anything that we have, the gold that we accumulate, the money that we accumulate. My son-in-law likes to tell everybody that I've got uh, cans of money stashed all, of, all over my yard. I don't know where he got that from, but he, he thinks that's appropriate for me to have cans of money stashed all over, over my yard. What a silly thing to do. You can take your money and put it in a coffee can and bury it in the ground, and what happens to it? If it's money, if it's dollar bills, it's going to rot away. All the other stuff is going to rust. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves can break through and steal. It's a terrible thing to have something stolen from you, but it happens all the time. Any treasures that we accumulate on this earth are all going to vanish away. They won't last very long. The second part of the verse says, but do store up treasures in heaven. Do indeed store up treasures in heaven. And that's the question I keep asking myself every time I come to this verse. How do we do this? Where is the bank of heaven? Where do we go to put treasure in heaven? How do we do this? What do we, what do, we do to put treasure in heaven? And over the years, I've been accumulating just a little list on, on ways that you and I can put treasure in heaven. And these are important. These are things that we can do today to put treasure in heaven. And shortly, when all of a sudden our time is over, we can go and see that treasure that we put in heaven. 
first of all, number one, I've got a list of at least 14 things here, and the list is growing, and it may be more than that by the time we get through. But first of all is make sure you've got an account there in heaven. Make absolutely sure you've got an account in heaven. You can't put treasure in heaven unless you've got an account there. You've got to have an account there. Did you know that you can prophesy, that you can do miracles in the name of Jesus Christ and still be lost and not go to heaven? There's a wonderful verse that always gets my attention, and I'm sure it gets yours attention too in Matthew. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then he says, Jesus is speaking here. He says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Wow. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. It's not that I did know you and I, I lost track with you. I never knew you, Jesus will tell these people. They perform miracles in the name of Jesus. Remember the, the magicians that came out when Moses went into Egypt and he did the miracles with the snakes and the other things and these, these people could come out and they could duplicate those miracles? It's possible for people to be able to preach in the name of Jesus Christ. It's possible for people to do miracles, to prophesy, to do all kinds of wonderful things and never yet get saved. Make absolutely sure you've got an account there in heaven. Brother Josh reminds us about that all the time, and, and we've all heard that. Most of us here tonight are Christians. I'm confident of that. But just in case you're not, number one step, before you put any treasure in heaven, make sure you've got an account there. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll confess the Lord with your mouth and believe on him with your heart, you will be saved, the Bible tells us. Salvation isn't hard. It's easy. Just believe on Jesus Christ. God made Jesus Christ to become sin for us who knew no sin himself that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. What a fantastic deal. Amen. I've never heard a deal to compare with that. that. Jesus Christ became sin for me so that I might become the righteousness of God through him. If you haven't trusted in Jesus, do that tonight. Do it right now. Trust in Jesus. And then you'll have an account in heaven. And you can begin to add, add things to it. The first thing that I've listed, and these aren't in any particular order, not even, not even order of importance, but they're good things that we can think about. Number one is to praise the Lord. That's one way to put treasure in heaven is just praising the Lord. The Bible says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Anytime we please God, we're putting treasure in heaven. Anytime we make God happy, anytime we get God uh, excited about what we're doing. We're putting treasure in heaven. Sacrifice of praise. Praise the Lord. It's a good idea to get in the habit of saying, praise the Lord, and mean it. Praise the Lord and say it with all your heart. Praise the Lord and mean it. I'm sure we'll all get to confess and praise the Lord when we get to heaven, but why do we have to wait till we get to heaven? Why not start right now? Praising the Lord. We can praise the Lord in these old earthly earth suits, as somebody's called them, these old earthly bodies. We can praise the Lord today, and that brings honor and glory to God. By the way, it's much more enjoyable to praise the Lord than it is to grumble. I know from personal experience. When we grumble and complain, it just makes us miserable, doesn't it? Never solves anything. It just makes us miserable. So praise the Lord. Whenever you feel like grumbling about something, instead praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Another way that we can serve the Lord is by contributing our resources to the Lord's work. Paul wrote to the Philippians. Remember, in Philippi is where he was in jail, one of the first places he went. This is amazing to me. He was led of the Holy Spirit to go across Asia and then cross the Aegean Sea to Philippi to preach the Word of God. And I'm sure he was thinking all the way, oh, goody, goody, I get to go and preach the, preach the Word and lots of people are going to come and listen to me. But very shortly he wound up in jail, in prison with his back bloodied. And he made some good friends there. He had no idea who the Lord was going to lead him to in Philippi, but yet he went to Philippi and he preached the Word and many people got saved. And he wrote back to these Philippians this little note. He said, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. And then listen to this. He says, Not that I am looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. <laughs> Paul wanted those Philippians to be rich in heaven. I want to be rich in heaven. I don't care too much about being rich on the earth. The Lord has given me all I need here on the earth. 
but I want to be rich in heaven, not for myself, but just so that I can, I can please the Lord by being rich in heaven. By being rich in heaven will mean that I serve the Lord while I was alive on this earth. We want to, we want to be rich in heaven. And Paul said, not that, it's, not that I need a gift. I'm not saying this so that you'll give me more money, but so that this will be credited to your account. Another wonderful way that we can put treasure in heaven is by aid, giving aid to the poor. Here's a, a long section of scripture, but bear with me. This has got a wonderful punchline at the end of it. Listen to it. It says, And behold, one came to Jesus and said to him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may, may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. And the man said unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said to Jesus, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What do I lack? What yet do I lack? And then listen to what Jesus told this young man. Jesus said unto him, If thou will be perfect, go and sell that you have, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. There's that phrase again. You'll have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard this saying, he went away very sorrowful and had great, because he had great possessions. This is one of those sad situations in the Bible. This man could have been a disciple of Jesus Christ. He might have been one of the more famous disciples. He could have had his name recorded in the Bible. He could have won many to the Lord, but he didn't follow Jesus. There's a lot in this particular parable that I don't fully understand. This is in the category of one of those hard sayings of Jesus. But one thing I do know, Jesus told this man, sell what you've got, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. So one way that you and I can have treasure in heaven is by giving to the poor. The Bible says, he that giveth to the poor lendeth to the Lord. Would you lend the Lord $10? Would you really? Would you lend God $10? Would you lend him $100? You can do that by giving to the poor. When the money you give to the poor people, you're lending it to the Lord. I don't personally think that the Lord wants me at this point in my life to to sell my house and my car and give all that to the poor and take Miss Cheryl and, and move off to Cuba or someplace like that. I don't think he does. I'm open to that. If I felt like the Lord wanted me to do that, I would do that. But I don't feel like the Lord wants me to do that right now. But I do think the Lord wants me to give what I have to the poor. So give to the poor. And the other one is just like it. The next way is give to the needy. And I'm going to read a couple of verses from Matthew chapter 6 if you'd like to turn there with me. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. I took my Bible marker out and lost my place. It says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen of them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, verse 2 reads, When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored to men. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. The Lord will reward us for giving to the needy folks, some of these people down at the rescue mission and other places. And we sometimes have to be careful the way we do this, but giving to the needy is a way of putting treasure in heaven. And then there's another wonderful way. Way seven on my list is to pray. Continuing on in the same section in the Bible, it says, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen of men. They just pray so people can see them. And I've seen people doing this. I've seen people stand on the street corners, and they have a big neon sign almost that says, Hey, these men are praying. Notice them. And they try to look so religious and so dignified. And they all get dressed up in, in black robes, and they stand there, and they bob back and forth, and they, they call attention to themselves. Jesus said, they have, they have already received their reward. When you pray, he says, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. By the way, I like that little phrase there, who is unseen. God is unseen, but that doesn't mean he's not here. <laughs> Just because we can't see God doesn't mean he's not right here, right now. The most powerful force in the universe, and God has not given us the eyesight to see him. That's amazing to me. God is unseen, but that doesn't mean he's not real. He is real. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When God sees our prayers, 
he will reward us. There's two dimensions of prayer at least. I've heard people talk about it. There's the outward dimension, which is very important. When we pray, basically to edify others. And sometimes the Lord gives us the words to say and good words, and they can be an encouragement to other people. But there's another dimension of prayer, and that's the vertical dimension. That's when we talk to God. And that's when we need to get alone in our closets and shut the door and pour out our hearts to the Lord. Praying that way is the kind of prayer that pleases the Lord, and he will reward us appropriately for it. And then another wonderful way is to fast secretly. This is something you and I don't do very much these days. Uh, these are all found in Matthew chapter 6. But fasting, fasting is a time when people say, I'm not going to eat for a, a couple of weeks. Or I'm not going to eat for a day or two. And I'm just going to get alone by myself and pray. Since Brother Roy's not here, let me just mention that when his son was sick years ago, remember that when he had cancer and he eventually succumbed to that? Brother Roy, Roy went without eating meat. For years and years and years, I don't know how many years he went without doing that, but he spent the time praying for his son. And Roy wasn't the kind that went around with a big sign on it saying, I'm fasting, I'm not eating meat. You had to kind of pry it out of him, and you'd finally find out what he was doing. When we fast, if you fast, do it discreetly under the Lord. Put on your, your perfumes and comb your hair and shave if you're a man and get all cleaned up and don't let people even know that you're fasting. And then your father, who is unseen, there's that word again, who is unseen, will reward you. Another way that we can serve the Lord uh, and get treasures in heaven is by uh, being kind to our Christian friends. Look around this room for a minute. Can you see anything that, that, that you'll see in heaven? Can you? Can you? You bet. You bet. We'll see each other in heaven. I don't know what we're going to look like. But we won't look like this, but we'll see each other. Remember the rich man and Lazarus? They had full recollection of their lifetimes on earth. And when we get to heaven, we're going to recognize one another. We're going to be able to see one another. Won't it be great to have somebody come up and say, because you gave me a track, I trusted the Lord as my Savior. Because you witnessed, I trusted the Lord as my Savior. Because you did this, I got to become a better Christian. Wouldn't it be great to get to heaven and say, you know, we didn't agree on the music. We didn't like the same kind of music, but we got along like Christians. We got along like Christians. We were kind to each other. We weren't mad and ugly and mean like I tend to be. And please forgive me whenever I'm that way. Uh, sometimes a bad streak comes out. But won't it be nice to say we faced these problems as Christians in the body of Christ and we did it well to please our Lord. We were serving the Lord. God, God, is, God is the head of the church. God is the head of the church. And we're doing these things to please Him. There's a wonderful verse that says that. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these things, all these virtues, put on love. L-O-V-E, the greatest action word in the Bible, love, love, which binds them all together. Just a couple more points, and I'm going to be through here for the night. Bear with me just a little bit longer. Verse, or way 10, I think I may have lost count here, but it's way 9 or way 10, one or the other. Bible reading and study. These are ways to put treasure in heaven. I'm sure we'll know and understand a lot better when we get to heaven, but until then, we need to keep on reading the Word of God. I've been reading the Bible most of my life. I, can st I remember starting seriously reading the Bible when I was 15 years of, of age. And every time I read it, it gets more and more exciting. I learn more and more. I heard one man say that he'd read the Bible all the way through, I think a dozen times. And he got through the last time and he said, I know everything that's in this book. I've read it through a dozen times. He was one of those guys that could sit down and just read. And he started out the 13th time to read the Bible through. And he filled up a whole pad of brand new things that he learned again and again. It helps us learn God's ways. It helps us to learn what God would have us to do. And it helps us to help others. There's a wonderful verse over in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, if you want to flip there with me. I've already got it marked, so I'm there. But let me read it to you. It says, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. And some scholars have had in there, more sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You'll receive a rich welcome. That's what I'm after. That's what I'd like to get. When I get to heaven, I want the Lord to put his arm around me and say, Well done, Bob. Well done. You did a good job. You did a good job. Receive a rich welcome. That's what we want. I don't want to have to sneak in and say, Ooh, how'd he make it? How'd he get into heaven? 
We want to get into heaven serving the Lord. Two more. Be salty and illuminating. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Let me read these to you real quickly. Matthew 5. It says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bushel. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Now listen to this verse. In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If they see our good works and glorify God, that's putting treasure in heaven for us by the good works that we do. I've called this be salty and be illuminating or be salty and be shiny. Be salty. Salt is different, but you can always tell when it's there, can't you? And you can always tell when it's not there. Be salty as Christians. One more, and we'll be at a good stopping point. And I think this is the best one for the night. Suffer persecution. Suffering persecution. Something that we rarely experience today. I've rarely been offended or persecuted because of my Christianity. Uh, there was one time when I got run off from a place for witnessing. Some guy came to the banister and said, I don't want you Christians around here. And I just went away rejoicing and praising the Lord. There's a wonderful verse that says this. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And then it says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets that went before you. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. I don't know of another place in the Bible where it says that, to be, to be exceeding glad. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Every time we suffer persecution. The sad thing today is that many of us aren't even known for being Christians. Our Christianity isn't salty enough. Nobody knows that we're Christians. Nobody knows that we're different. Nobody knows that we've got Jesus Christ living within us. And we ought to, our lives ought to just radiate that. People ought to, that know us ought to know the fact that we're Christians. They ought to recognize something different about us when we step in line at McDonald's. They ought to know something different about us by the way we drive our car, by the way we hold doors for other people, by the way we're kind. Let, let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And then suffer persecution. Live the kind of life that people would want to persecute you because, because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for listening to me tonight. I praise the Lord for the opportunity to be here. Let's close in just a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness and for the Word of God and for this book that you've given us to read and to study. And Lord, our goal is not to become smart Alex. Our goal is not to just walk around sprouting verses and showing everybody how much Scripture we know. That's not it at all. But Lord, we want to serve you better. We want to be pleasing to your sight. We want to do what's right. We want to be rich in heaven. We want to put treasure in heaven and help us to do that tonight, dear Lord. Help me to do that. Help all of us to do that. I pray in your wonderful name. Amen. Just one more thing. The best way to put treasure in heaven is something I'll tell you about next week. Like, like they used to say in the Beverly Hillbillies, y'all come back now. You hear it?